Thank you for joining us this afternoon. We're going to be looking today at uh, sending AAC home, discovering different options to increase AAC in all settings. We're here with our amazing speech therapist, Miss Katie Sample. Hi. And so Katie's our AT specialist in the southeastern region of Louisiana. Her office is in Gonzales. And she's SLP, and she's focusing on the pediatric population in both clinic and school settings. And she's a certified autism specialist, okay? So um, she's a Baton Rouge native, and she went to LSU for both her bachelor's and master's programs. And she's got years of experience in the area of alternative and alternative communication, specifically with use with children on that autism spectrum. And um, thank you for that introduction, Josh. So again, my name's Katie Sample. I'm an SLP certified autism specialist. I'm, I'm in Gonzales and um, love working with our friends with the, with AAC and especially on the uh, autism spectrum. This is the link to get to the presentation and to the resources within the, with the presentation, um, but I think this link is also in the chat. Okay, so today we're going to discover why we need AAC in all environments and uh, why it's best practice. Um, we're going to display some statewide data that I received from all from uh, across the state and majority of you probably uh, even participated in that questionnaire that I sent out uh, regarding AAC policies. Um, we're going to observe some specific policies that uh, different districts use. Uh, we're going to look at some federal state laws regarding AAC implementation um, and then look at some different tools uh, in order to implement and, uh, AAC in different environments and as well as uh, different strategies for when we send AAC home. Okay, so let's jump into AAC within all environments. Okay, so we can't just have AAC in speech therapy. Tammy talked about this a good bit uh, within her session. So if an AAC learner, look at that uh, stat at the bottom, if an AAC uh, user were to only use their device in therapy two times a week for their uh, speech sessions, it would take 84 years for them to use that language that they're exposed to in those sessions. That's a significantly uh, long time for somebody to just get um, a, a basic need that we all get to use every day in order to express our wants and needs. And uh, there's that stat earlier that uh, Tammy was referring to as well about how often babies are exposed to uh, spoken language. So it's just kind of a baseline for us to have going forward on how much we need to implement AAC. And so also if we're just implementing AAC at school, that's, that's not within every single environment. So let's jump into that. Um, this link right here was shared by ASHA I mean, not shared by Dasha, I'm sorry, shared by, uh, it is within Asha and it's an article within Asha, just talking about AAC implementation uh, throughout the day um, and within different settings and then uh, especially building at home as well. And so then how do we do that? We need to have several visual supports. We need to engineer that environment uh, and train our communicative partners and definitely jump into some aided language stimulation. Well, what is aided language stimulation? So ASHA states that it's uh, a language intervention that we embed in all contexts, functional and meaningful, and it promotes transactional communication in the natural environment. Okay, so the premise is that they wouldn't be able to use AAC if it wasn't modeled without all of their activities and throughout their day. Um, and it's a multi-stage technique that we use in conjunction with verbal speech. So we're lending off of our body, off of uh, what we're naturally saying, and then extending that to um, a device so that we can model, model that language mode. And then we can highlight a specific a vocabulary within that. Um, the goal is that it's used at least 80% of the day um, and that we can model that vocabulary on various uh, different modes of so various different um, pragmatic functions as well. Um, I've got some links that are at the end of this presentation uh, that are great for y'all to share with staff and with families with aided uh, language stimulation. So uh, what, how I like to explain this is if a student were in a um, French immersion school, they're gonna be speaking French all day, every day. Well, what happens if they just heard one French word on a Monday at 12 o'clock 
and they didn't hear French any other part of the day. Well, how are they supposed to be speaking French? So we really, really have to embed this language system within their entire day and show them how we can, uh, how we're using it. And it, it also normalizes it for that student as well. I also really, really encourage students and peers engaging within that AAC system because kids like kids. So um, when they see peers engaging in that, it also becomes a good bit more normalized. Okay, so communication does not just stop at school. As I mentioned earlier, um, we want complex, communicate, complex communicators to use these in all environments. Um, and families are a really, really big piece within this. So here's some, uh, just some links for y'all to be able to use with families um, to be able to implement these strategies. So this first one uh, is uh, promoted by Assistiveware and it's language opportunities for ASC at home. And this is just a really good little article uh, for y'all to share uh, within the IEP team of why this needs to be in, in any and every place, especially at home. Uh, this next guy using core word of the week this is just a link to go to this core word of the week uh, link right here. This is in the Assistiveware core word classroom. So um, you, you could follow this link and it's gonna ask you for an email. The entire thing is free. And my favorite little tool is down here in the core word of the week planners. And this literally gives some cookie cutter of what to do with embedding some core vocabulary throughout the day. And then another, uh, resource for you all is uh, AAC Prompt, and y'all have probably seen this before if you've uh, attended these webinars, but this is just a really, really good tool, and I encourage y'all to use the, print them out, put them on the wall, send them home, so that everybody can just get a nice visual reminder, because visuals work really great for us grown-ups as well, um, on that AAC prompting and implementation. All right, so now I'm gonna jump into the data that I collected across the state. So within the different LEAs and districts that I contacted throughout our state, we had 57 out of 70 responses, which was pretty great. So thank you, thank you very, very much if y'all participated within this poll uh, so that we can see how everybody's um, using AAC uh, policies throughout our state so that we can learn from each other. Um, I think it's really, uh, fantastic that we have this platform and format that you can see what's happening outside of just your district. You know, sometimes we're in district A and we're following our policies in district A, but forget about, oh, there's outside possibilities and what's happening at BCD. So um, thank you all again for participating so that we can uh, see this data. Okay, so the first question that I asked was, does your district um, I'm sorry, I can't see the top of my screen. Does your district send uh, AAC devices home over school nights and over the weekend? 70% said yes. And hip hip hooray for that 70% that said yes. Um, sometimes uh, it's, it's due to a liability and, and things like that, but hopefully with um, seeing some forms later, some districts can look at those resources. Um, again, I wanted to say, um, that every district is gonna be different dis, uh, different, and I um, took this data to not say who's right and who's wrong, but I um, took it more so that we could see just straight uh, raw data of what's happening across the state. Okay, so the next question that I asked were, was do you send AAC home over the summer? And 52% said yes, and 48% uh, was no. Uh, then I asked, does your school district, I'm getting blocked at the top, I'm sorry. I said, does your school district allow for uh, personal AAC devices uh, purchased by the student's family to come on the school campus? And 95% said yes, just 5% was no. And then I asked, so if they do send, of that 95% that answered yes, I said, if they do send those devices home, um, do you support those devices? Do you use those devices uh, on your campus? And 92% was yes. Okay, so this was a little bit of an oddball question. I said, uh, does your LEA district ever touch insurance? Do y'all ever help families go through insurance policies in order to acquire their own devices? 
And I was a little surprised uh, about the yeses that I got. I got 44% said, yes, we do help out a good bit. Um, and within that 44%, I said, um, I asked who helps write those reports. A good bit of it was the student's SLP uh, or the AT facilitator, or the, uh, it was a collaboration between the IEP's team. That was the majority of the answers within that. Okay, so let's jump into how we can uh, implement uh, utilization within these questions that I asked. Okay, so the first one, obtaining an AAC device. All right, so right here is a uh, good little link to Bulletin 1508 that talks about AAC uh, implementation and the responsibilities um, specifically with assistive technology in schools. So in section 1305 and page 13 uh, is where they address assistive technology. And right here, number two, talks about the um, requirements in purchasing, um, leasing, and uh, leasing otherwise providing an acquisition of AT for students with disabilities. Okay, so there are a couple of alternative methods on how you could uh, get those and there is insurance. Now this is just something that is up to your uh, district, up to your LEA if y'all uh, want to touch or, um, or what's out there. But I just wanted to mention that there are options and the uh, IDA mentioned Medicaid a little bit um, with ac acquiring AT and just laying that resource for y'all. Um, one of the districts gave me uh, their procedures on how they acquire AT. Um, and with it, they said that they trial the device um, and then they submit uh, an order to the SPED director for approval. And then when it's approved, um, they submit to the SBO to, uh, to place the order to the vendor. And then it gets shipped to the warehouse and then delivered to the AT facilitator. And then the equipment is inventoried into their database. And then the equipment is signed out to the student and the AT facilitator sets up and delivers training uh, to the personnel that's going to implement that tool. Okay, so jumping into the second part, sending AAC home overnight or over weekends. All right, so to address this, I uh, pulled the a SHRAG letter. And so a SHRAG letter is um, when OSEP, that's the Office of Special Education, the um, when OSEP, uh, basically addresses a, a question about how the policy should be carried out basically. Um, and so within this SHRAC letter, um, they asked us specifically about um, assistive technology. So uh, right here is where I'm gonna point out, uh, they talked about technology must be provided to implement the IEP. Um, and as a part of the uh, public agencies part B obligation to provide fate to ensure the child with disabilities, the public agency must ensure that special education and related services are provided uh, to meet IEP needs. Okay, so if the IEP needs, let's say that it's a uh, child will elicit one MLU, both uh, whether it's verbal, sign, or implemented with AAC um, spontaneously, how are they going to work on that goal at home if they don't have access to that device? How are they gonna uh, be able to integrate this? And also how are they going to be able to work on any of their homework at home as well? Um, this is the link to the Shrack letter right here. And also this is a whole post off a of practical AAC with this link right here. And she goes, uh, basically the, the post itself is, can they take their devices home? And this is when she refers to that Shrack letter. And uh, you can find some more resources there um, to talk about integration at home. Um, a little uh, adjunct, but what was also in this letter, and I just wanted to point it out because I thought that it was uh, interesting. They said, is there a time limit on implementation uh, of the updated IEP? Every time uh, I have a, every time it's implemented, I have a, a bit of a lag, it looks like. So they said, it's expected that the special education and related services set out in the IEP will be provided by the agency beginning immediately after the IEP is analyzed. Uh, so it shouldn't take a long time for the student to get their AAC rolling um, in any and every environment right after that uh, new IEP is written um, as stated here by OSEP. Okay, so again, uh, I stated, so how are they gonna uh, do any other goals or reach any other goals 
um, and practice those goals in, in, in every environment if they don't have that device. Um, IDEA talks about AT right here. Each public agency must ensure that the AT device um, or services are, as those terms are defined in this section of the section, um, are made available to a child with a disability and then they write the requirements. So there's basically gives us vocabulary of we need to be providing it to them, to them, to them. And it doesn't say limitations to um, only at school. So we uh, definitely want them to have it in every, any and every environment. This uh, example of how AT I sent home was provided by Ms. Sharon Edwards at um, Ascension Parish. So they use this form right here at the beginning of the school year, but this is also the form that they use to send home over the summer as well. And, but uh, within their parish, they say that it's an IEP decision whether the device is gonna go home or not. There's always different circumstances that the entire team needs to consider about that expensive device going uh, home, back and forth. So definitely a decision that should be made amongst the entire team. All right, so now addressing AAC going home over the summer. Uh, so right here, first I addressed ESY. So this is a link uh, going into RITS law, looking at uh, ESY services. And this is just a really good resource so that you can look at uh, what the law states about ESY. Um, so how are we going to ask them to maintain any of their skills that were addressed on that IEP without their AAC, right? So that's what we all look at it is... Is this student gonna be able to, um, if this student doesn't receive services, will they be able to carry on uh, their skills that they've gained? Um, okay, well, maybe they don't require the services and they didn't require ESY, but how in the world are they gonna maintain that they were using two to three word sentences on their AAC device without their AAC device? Um, also, if they did qualify for AAC, and I mean for ESY, sorry, if they did qualify for ESY, and AAC is on their ESY goals, how are they going to meet any of those goals if they don't have their device? Um, also right here, so bulletin 1872C, uh, this is um, where the entire document is about ESY. Um, and this is on page 11 where you can see where they talk about AT. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit more onto number four there. And this is where they say a student has an assistive tech a student has an assistive technology device and it is essential for that student to use the system technology through the summer to maintain his her functional level of the device. I like this statement a lot. I think it should be printed on walls and I'm glad to share this resource with y'all. Okay, so uh, these forms were shared with me by Miss Michelle Fontenot at St. Martin Parish. And uh, this form right here, this is their, uh, agreement form. Uh, th this is basically the first and second page of what they do to learn out their devices. I believe that they use this to, uh, form for uh, for during the school year as well, um, but I'm putting it right here as, uh, as a summer example. I blocked out uh, the names of the parish just in case anybody wants to uh, use these forms and we didn't have an accident with uh, carrying over the parish's name, but just an example of uh, some forms that uh, you can use in order to send these devices home during different parts of the year. And thank y'all both very much for sharing these resources so that we can um, share this across the state. They're really, really great. Okay, so now jumping into allowing personal devices on campus and support in utilization. So some families are motivated to have their own personal device. And why would they be motivated to have their own personal device? Well, they might be moving a good bit. And if, they, if they're moving a good bit, then it would be pretty ideal if they had their own. And then also they're gonna turn 21 eventually. And so if they already have, um, if they already have their own device, then they kind of got to skip a few steps with the, uh, within that transition uh, policy. However, within the transition policy right here, so this is a really great resource that, um, Justin Sims shared with me. I'm gonna jump to it right here. So within this transition policy, um, this is 
from the Center of Technology and Disability Family and Information Guide to Assistive Technology and Transition Plan. This is a really, 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 really great resource. AT is most of the time overlooked within the uh, transition plan. So it's a really, really great resource. Thanks again, Justin, um, for uh, everybody to use during that time. Um, jumping back in here. So we definitely want to ensure that uh, we're facilitating those meetings and talking about AT carryover. Um, sometimes families even purchase the AAC, the devices, AT devices, AAC devices from the district or the LEA. Um, and then within those meetings talking about um, maybe they need some new equipment that works better in different work or uh, higher ed environments. And I mentioned Latan right there because Latan is often the go-to for uh, getting uh, devices for when they're aging out at uh, 21. So as far as families being motivated by getting by maybe getting their own devices, um, they let's say that they had their own device and let's say that they used a device using um, language system X, okay? And at school, they had been using this other language system because it was what everybody else in the classroom was using and everybody is trained on language system B. And we are not gonna do language system X because we are only doing language system B. Well, that's like using different languages in different environments and how are they gonna learn how are they going to learn those? So this is uh, an example, and this is a, an image that I made. Y'all are more than welcome to use this, but this is saying um, hello in 20 different languages. So it's as if I'm trying to teach you Mandarin in one spot, but you're being made to use um, Swahili in another spot. So we want to make sure that those language systems have consistency in order uh, for that child to be able to utilize them and achieve those language goals and be independent with that language uh, system and device. Here's what Asha says. Asha says that family members are an integral part of this entire process of the assessment process of understanding um, what their strengths and weaknesses are, of identifying what their goals should be, and that they have input on the type of AAC system used for daily communication needs and vocabulary incorporated in the system. They state that ensuring, ensuring carry over and functional use of AAC. They even quoted that partial or complete abandonment of AAC can occur when the family input is not considered an AAC intervention. Imagine this. Let's say that the family input is not considered and let's consider not even incorporating the family in utilization within this AAC system. So we're not sending it home. We're not um, sending it in all environments. And um, we definitely didn't ask them if they wanted to get uh, their own device if that's the route that they wanted to do. How, what do we think the abandonment rate's gonna be there? So um, this is definitely some great data to have in, in order to consider that we um, want this system and device to be utilized everywhere. And I got a nice little visual for that later on. So let's look at some tools for uh, implementation. So I wanted to talk about cases for sure, because you never hear about anybody talking about cases. And then cases are really uh, integral part uh, in AAC use. So I just put, I put embedded some links in here to these different devices, but um, what you'll see that carries over in all of them is that there's definitely some amplification embedded in them because we use our voices, not just in a quiet room, we use our voices in the cafeteria and outside. Um, but I do wanna point out that sometimes these cases require a separate charger. There are some new and updated devices uh, that already have the uh, cases embedded and you can you just do one charger in one spot, but wanted to point that out that sometimes you're charging the iPad and you're charging the case at the same time. You want this to be hands-free as well. Nobody carries around my larynx. Nobody carries around my voice for me. And I have to go yank or point or throw a chair in order for them to come give me my voice back. Okay, so uh, I think that using something that's hands-free like a strap um, can help out a good bit. This is a link right here for a strap. Um, and this is to Amazon. Uh, 
uh, there and wanted to point out that there's Amazon uh, educator accounts so you can sometimes get these uh, discounted. You want to make sure that these are durable. So a lot of our friends that are getting AAC for the first time and they're seeing their talker for the first time are going to be pretty upset because this has been their YouTube device and nonstop I can just stim on YouTube all day. So the, uh, they might be pretty um, not too happy that they don't get to do that. So you wanna um, make sure that this the case is pretty, pretty tough to um, protect that device inside there. Also, you wanna make sure that uh, these guys are on a vertical um, and uh, OTs recommend a good bit for uh, when you're implementing, especially with kids on the spectrum for things to be on a vertical. This is when you think see things on a slant board versus flat on the table. So it goes within their uh, visual plane. Um, these are just some reminders of providing clear direction in order to get AAC implemented at home. So this is, again, that cool word of the week. These are pretty cookie cutter. I mean, it gives you exact and particular things to do at home. So these are really, really great and uh, to give families uh, to have carryover. Again, this is a good visual to just say we want AAC in every single environment. It can go to you uh, with you to Area 51, to trick or treat, to McDonald's, to your mama's house. It can go everywhere. Um, and don't forget about that uh, that strategy for aided language stimulation. Right here is a really good article that talks about just extending your language or using the AAC system to talk to the AAC user. And this is that handy can handy dandy uh, a little movie talking about um, implementation with AAC systems in all environments and finding a higher success. Um, and we definitely want to make sure that we're using pragmatic versatility. There's your right here is a link with uh, this wording and this is a different link right here with this visual uh, that just gives different examples of pragmatic versatility. I don't just request all day. I can tell people to do things. I can make suggestions and I can agree and disagree. Um, and let's say that you had ordered that uh, AAC, it hadn't got home all the way yet. Uh, I mean, it hadn't got to your school yet, but you needed that AAC to get rolling. Well, let's say that they have a printer at home or you have a printer at school and you can mail it to them. Um, you can definitely implement that low tech at home. This link right here, I made y'all a little folder with just some um, frequently used uh, eight sys language systems. We can definitely give y'all more if y'all use anything outside of LAMP Perlico and speak for yourself, but um, made y'all that little folder so y'all can get some quickie um, low tech boards. But let's say that, um, I don't know, you had difficulty sending anything in the mail or they didn't have a printer. You can use your handy dandy local Dollar Tree, Dollar Store for some stickies and some um, Sharpies and make a little core board um, and model for families how to use that core board. And then also you can use uh, Jamboards. Jamboards and education about Jamboards have come out a lot lately well, as we're going through this whole uh, new change in uh, life and doing a lot of things uh, digitally. This is link right here. It goes to a pretty cool um, blog. It's called We Be Jamming and it uh, talks about modeling uh, AAC within um, a Jamboard. Okay, so just to show you all the different uh, options that I was talking about earlier, this guy up top, this is the eye adapter and this is the eye adapter six. Now these do get a little pricey. These are uh, about, sometimes they're about 400 or so, but they they, have, they come with the whole kit and caboodle. They, they're amplified, they're hands-free, they're durable. The, um, and they come with the strap as well. Um, and I mean, so they're already on eye adapter, I think six. And so that's just from families coming back and forth saying, you're giving this to my kid with autism and the, um, you're giving this to my kid with autism and they, uh, <laughs> they're throwing it across the room because again, it's not their YouTube talker. So that, um, so that's where they've gotten a good bit more durable. This guy right here, sometimes you find him on, uh, Amazon. Sometimes you don't, it's a tune box. It's, it's basic, and they even used to have it at Kmart, to be honest, but um, it has basically this Bluetooth speaker that's embedded within the case, and it's got a handle, and you just buy the strap uh, separately, and these are two devices that are, um, this is a PRC, I think this is the 1300, and this is the uh, Toby i110, and I believe with both of those, the speakers are already embedded into those, uh, into those cases. And again, you want everything to be on vertical. I see so many times walking into a classroom, their AC is flat on the desk. This isn't easy for our friends, especially on the spectrum. 
Hey, Katie. I don't have that strong core. Yes, ma'am. Um, there is a couple of questions in the chat. Would you like me to read them to you? Sure thing. Okay, the first one is, how do you address the issues of others changing the AAC device that will be modified um, the board use in the classroom? You said, I'm looking at that again. How do you address, say that one more time for me. How do you address the issue of others changing the AAC device that will modify the board use in the classroom? So are we saying modify Oh, like modifying the language and modifying the, um, the I think that's what Ms. Patty's. Yeah, the device um, that they're using in the classroom. Like, how do you address that issue with others? So I'm, I'm assuming that she's saying that, let's say that the uh, SLP um, put on, maybe they have like five core vocabulary boards on there, but then somebody uh, wanted to make sure that they were able to say bird and apple and ecosystem and things like that and modified that, uh, that AAC device. Um, so I think that big, big time that's with education and with education, with the staff, um, AAC shouldn't just be plopped in front of somebody. Um, it, it requires a good bit of training. And so within this entire thing, we've talked about AAC going home and, uh, why it should go home. They also require a ton of training. This happens a lot with not just into the classroom, but also at home, you know, there's a good bit of education that needs to be spread about the versatility of core vocabulary versus fringe because a lot of times in the classroom and a lot of times at home everybody gets stuck on noun 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 and because everybody's stuck on noun they're um they're ending up adding on so much more vocabulary that this was not the SLP's plan and this was not where this child is at as far as their, uh, as far as their device, if, if this is the language system that they have, that they're not um, being exposed to that that much language and it's being built. Um, so really, I think it's more so education within the team um, to uh, to talk about. Please, 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 don't look, don't add things on here, um, because this child is working on mastery. So then, building from that is working on. Let's make this core vocabulary versatile. Now, in conjunction with that, I do think that it's never to say we should never uh, show fringe vocabulary ever. But there's no way we need to totally show fringe vocabulary because the um, because that's also building up their semantic knowledge, their semantic language level. So uh, what I find is super, super uh, helpful with that is um, definitely using some low tech, but then at the same time, you can also make it tactile so they get to hold this language and they get to move around the language. So let's say that you're using some lessons from um, uh, Unique. A lot of times they'll uh, have the vocabulary that's implemented there uh, on a back page on, on a couple of pages at the end. And so using those, you can cut them out and you can laminate them so that the child can feel this language, feel the, uh, feel the cords, do stuff with the cords. So now you've addressed uh, their visual, uh, tactile and auditory uh, input input needs by um, just using a resource that's in the back. I kind of got on a tangent there, but to, to answer the first, um, I definitely think the answer is just education, 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 but really a ton of education before the AC device is even brought to the child. Ton, ton, yeah. ton, ton. We have a second question. Mm -hmm. it says, do you recommend a dedicated iPad for communication separately from a play slash entertainment iPad? I can't say a big enough yes to that. Yes, bolded and underlined and amplified times a hundred. Um, so I recommend their AAC devices. You just call it a talker. Don't call it an iPad. Don't call it a tablet. Don't call it an anything like that. I recommend calling it a talker. If y'all have a different uh, little name that you want to give to it, that's fine. A lot of people use the word, use talker. Um, so, and by giving it this entirely different name, then now it has this entirely different function. On their talker, they should not be able to access anything, the camera, the internet, the anything. This is very important that this iPad is a dedicated device especially for testing, they, when, uh, when LEAP comes into play, they shouldn't be able to 
have any device that can connect to any outside entity whatsoever uh, to meet those guidelines uh, within LEAP, within that uh, LEAP Connect especially. The, uh, so yes, the, uh, and so iPads should definitely be used as a tool within the classroom um, because there's just so much versatility within it. Um, the, but they, they definitely need to be separate. I do find a little bit more, um, it helps to, to change the size of their work play iPad versus the talker, just as an extra cue for the kid. So the, um, so let's say that you just have a regular uh, plain old size of an iPad, but you used a mini for their uh, classroom engagement or their uh, play engagement. Honestly, that might help a good bit with budgeting as well, but um, that if you're giving iPads to everybody in the classroom, you went for the minis versus the, uh, versus the regular size. Um, I'm really glad that you pointed that out. There's another question in the question answer. It's kind of long. I can read it to you, or would you like to open that up? I'll open it up. Okay. Okay. So besides core vocabulary. Yes, ma'am. That's it. Besides core vocabulary, you wouldn't you start with the student expressing high valued item at home or expressing himself appropriately with the device? Some of my parents are overwhelmed by teaching core vocabulary, and I have to teach the core board gradually. Mm. Okay, I'm going to say this. Within a specific therapy technique, it's not going to be one size fit all. And we can definitely say that for kids on the spectrum. So, you know, if you've ever been to any autism trainings ever, you hear the same statement every single time. If you've met one kid with autism, you've only met one kid with autism because everybody's uh, different. So we definitely can't have a one size fit all um, for as far as implementation and teaching. However, there is so, so, so much versatility within that core vocabulary. So let's take a word like go, which is majority SLP's favorite, including me. The, um, because you can do so much with go. So let's say that their highly valued item at home was a ball or a goldfish or a, a core or bubbles. We can do so much with go with any of that stuff. Okay. Now, we definitely would want to extend and use that specific vocabulary worth it, word with it. So let's say that it was goldfish and they said, and we prompted for go and they had to, and let's say, I mean, be playful with it. Let's say that the goldfish had to, I mean, you got to, I don't know, throw it in the child's plate, be playful. Like, Oh, go goldfish. Woo. You have to go swim uh, over to this spot over here. The, um, so the child would, and whether we're using max assist or wherever we're at, as far as, um, AC utilization, they, uh, they access go. And so then we'll just extend, oh, go goldfish. And we can even model with a separate language board so that they can see that, uh, that vocabulary. But there is just so much value with having a versatile word introduced at, at, even at the beginning. Um, I had a friend that when he was, he had, he was uh, five, when he finally got his uh, AAC system and his first, and the word that we first focused on was go. And he, he was a child that you had to really, really dig to see what was he motivated by. He was motivated by bubbles, but not the bubbles themselves. He was motivated by seeing the reflection of himself in the bubbles. Okay. So if I were to just focus on that, specific uh, vocabulary, I mean, of what he was motivated by. If, even if I introduced the word bubble, it wasn't even that he wanted the bubble. He just wanted to see himself in that bubble. So it's really would be a me. But the, um, but because he, we got to really, really work on that word go and then just extend it. Oh, go, go bubble, go more bubble. And, um, and then from that word, then we got to transform it into, he got to tell Miss Katie to go away. And he'd say, go, and I'd run, 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 go away. And we got to transform that word a good bit so that he had uh, versatility within it. Thank you so much for that question. And, and it really is good. So, um, it's a hard concept for families uh, with core versus fringe. Um, with core versus fringe as far as um, it, it's so easy to just nouns. It's so easy to, well, he likes nerds and I want to give him nerds and he needs to ask for nerds. Well, he can ask for more and he could say that and he could say want 
We do a lot of other things other than just that. However, again, definitely still need to introduce the concept of fringe vocabulary. Um, I suggest to some separate modes so that it, um, they can really, really master the vocabulary that you're introducing them to. But um, also, um, every child is different, again, on, on that approach. So um, there are some friends that even ranging off of their diagnoses respond to um, one form of uh, how a language system is built versus another. So if one friend that uh, has one specific uh, neurological uh, or, or has one specific disorder, but can follow an AAC system that uh, is more kind of organized by category might work better than a friend uh, spe maybe specifically with a, a social language disorder that works really well with following a specific motor plan, uh, language acquisition through motor plan approach. So every child's different. Thanks so much for that question. I'm gonna scroll back up to that data collection that y'all oh so graciously participated in. And thank you, thank you again for participating in that. I'm sorry that my uh, computer's freezing up. This bit, this visual right here, y'all, I'm kind of obsessed with it. So the uh, y'all are, <laughs> are definitely more than welcome to use that. Um, I'm just scrolling up on here. I am interested to hear from y'all and if y'all could participate in the chat to let me know if any of y'all were shocked by any of this data or by any of the answers. I'm not gonna lie, I was shocked by the, um, by this one right here, by if, uh, if they touched insurance because um, because any of the school systems that I worked in, they, it was a big, big no-no. But I, I'm, and it's not to say right or wrong anywhere. Every district has their own policies. The, um, but I was shocked and, and surprisingly uh, happy to see that 44% said yes. I'll go to that Q&A. Two, two separate files. Yes, shocked. Uh, yeah, I was, yeah. Thanks, Jennifer. I was super shocked about that. The, um, I also want to hear from y'all if you think that sharing this data, if maybe your district might have been some of the no's for any of these questions, if by sharing this data that it might help or affect how policies are used and implemented in your district or LEA. Because um, that's the goal from that data collection was to, um, was to share, was to help districts develop uh, policies. Were your respondents from all parishes, districts, or heavily from particular? This was the entire state. I contacted where, was it heavier from one, some areas responding versus others? It was pretty spread out. So it wasn't just more so the South versus the North or more so Central versus anything else. I mean, I was pretty happy with the ride spread. I mean, y'all <laughs> might've seen a little bit of, um, y'all might've seen a little bit of uh, a couple of emails from me. Uh, when I contacted again saying, hey, I didn't hear your answer yet. And I really want your answer. And it's just because I, uh, I really wanted, um, I really wanted to get a nice sample size. And so again, that was from 50, my computer is just freezing, sorry. Uh, that was 57 out of 72, I believe that I contacted of the district, different districts and, uh, and LEAs. There we go. And again, so that was 70% that said that they sent home over nights and weekends. That was 52% that said they sent it home over the summer. And that was uh, 95, super, super happy about this, 95 that um, said that they took it on school campuses. What even prompted this second question right here was my good friend, Teresa, that uh, is helping out with the Q&A. She said, well, you can ask them if they allowed on school campuses, but did they use it if it was sent? And I'm glad she said that because of the 95%, 8% said, nope, we're going to use what we have and not with this family purchase, the, um, which again, there is no right or wrong answer. Every, every district has their own policy. Again, this is just raw data, but, the, um, but I'm very glad, Teresa, that you had brought that up because, I mean, everybody is different on, on how they're going to implement that. Yeah, the, uh, I see Margaret saying, yes, yeah, surprised. I mean, so uh, if you are interested in that on, you know, our district says that that would be okay for us to, oh, it's freezing up again. That would be, in, we are interested in our district, maybe touching, uh, doing some insurance stuff. Reach out to me, a coworker um, 
of my Miss uh, Terry Belknap and I have really jumped into the whole uh, how to address insurance um, within acquiring AAC systems. To be honest, it's really the um, the provider. They do most of the work for you. So they ask for a report for the SLP to show the report. They're going to ask for some data, and I mean, most of the time it's those uh, it's those providers. Whether you're contacting PRC or Toby or Talk to Me Technologies or Forbes or um, AbleNet, the, um, most of the time they, they, they you're you're giving them the data and they're the ones that are dealing directly with the uh, insurance company. Where it comes sticky is the um, is if you have non Medicaid students really because that's where it poses the oh well they didn't cover this whole portion so now the parish is responsible for covering the rest of it well uh, it, it's it's however your district looks at it because you would have to cover the entire thing anyways if you're just going through the through 1508 and you're going through to purchase the um purchase the device i'm looking at rosemary more challenging is getting the classroom staff to understand and use the devices too often it's on the cupboard or the shelf. Listen, there is this um, visual that I am obsessed with. It's that, uh, oh, who are those guys? It's like the, the dad, the grandpa and the son and they run some motor shop or something and they're throwing a, a, a chair across the room and they say, where's your AAC device? And they say, it's in the closet. And they go, why is it in the closet? Or uh, how are you gonna communicate? And they say, with my body instead. And they're throwing a chair across the room. But uh, <laughs> that's, uh, maybe you could share that uh, meme with them because it's pretty on point. The, um, Ms. Rosemary, the, uh, really, I, I feel like it's nonstop education, education. So we're a resource that does a ton of con continuing ed, um, but we really do reinforce that um, this continuing ed isn't just through, just with the AT or just with um, just with the SLPs. I mean, we need to be giving continuing ed to the paras big time. They're the ones that's with the kid all day and definitely inclusion teachers because the um, it's sometimes that's also where the kid is at all day and they're like, what's this thing? Are they supposed to play on it? What's going on? That using inappropriate vocab, they're letting some other kids hold it for them. I mean, it's an, it is okay for you to set a goal to say child independently carried communicative device from point A to point E, 80% um, across a specific time reference. That is an okay goal. In fact, I'm a fan of small goals so that uh, we can get a higher achievement rate. Do, assist, do we assist an insurance personal? We do assist in uh, personal, getting personal devices, but most of the time it's through Medicaid. Generally, we end up putting it on the high cost grant through the state. I'm glad that you mentioned grants because that's something that we uh, can't forget about. And I'm pretty sure that most of y'all are familiar with, with grants and with coworkers writing grants, but that's definitely that we can uh, jump into. Um, that's definitely something we can jump in that uh, anybody can jump into writing a grant. There's uh, was one that was uh, pretty close by. My boss just found the, uh, just found the link. Maybe if you could put that in the chat, that's the, uh, that is the meme that I'm, uh, one of the memes I'm referring to. Um, uh, yeah, there he goes. That's the link. Um, don't forget about grants and about, especially, I mean, maybe the grant is how you're going to get those cases and those durable cases. Um, as Patty's saying that, uh, most of the time they're scared that they're going to break it and that's why they put it up. You know what? It's okay. Are you, here's, here's something that we can pose to them. A child is screaming nonstop. Oh no, they might get vocal nodules because they're screaming so loud. So maybe we should take their voice out just so that they don't get vo vocal nodules. Do we do that? No, we don't ever do that. And so it's the same thing. It's the same thing for, for these friends. <laughs> okay, they might break it, but we still need to implement it and uh, utilize it as much as possible. Um, Y'all's Q&A is great. Thanks so much. Um, and that was, I think so much, uh, Ms. Patty for pointing that out, but, um, so, I mean, sometimes we have to get graphic with our, uh, with how we're going to compare AC utilization, the same thing. Am I going to take out my whole laryngeal cavity and put it inside of a cabinet and somebody will give it back to me? Am I going to put a duct tape over my mouth? We've all heard the duct tape example, the, um, so that I can't utilize AC. So, I mean, sometimes using those is, uh, is kind of what helps out within that, um, I'm trying to go for it. Y'all, I'm sorry, my computer's just lagging. I think it's the 
everybody's on their computers working from home right now. Um, I'm stuck, sorry. <laughs> I was about to go forward to show you all those, uh, those laws again. Um, if anybody is interested in using any of those forms that are displayed, I can contact those. Um, you can definitely use the images uh, definitely from uh, the presentation themselves as far as the model and I blacked, I blacked out the names of the, again, I blacked out the names of the, um, oh my goodness, I blacked out the names of the, uh, I'm going forward, of the different uh, parishes j just in case um, somebody wouldn't accidentally use that name. But uh, some of these were made by scratch from the AT facilitator. So do not be scared by making by scratch. I believe that Michelle Fontenot made these by scratch, to, um, from scratch, sorry, to, um, to build in. Oh, Tammy just put in a, uh, one of those memes as well. So you could see they were um, using a chair, you know, because because behavior is language. It's just telling you something. It's inappropriate language, but it is, it's communication. It's just inappropriate. Um, Ms. Patty says she always equates it to using a wheelchair. We don't deny them use of it just because they may break it. Same for communication. That's a really, really good parallel, Ms. Patty. Thanks so much for that. And in case y'all didn't see that, she's equivalating AAC with a wheelchair. So she's saying we wouldn't deny them to use a wheelchair just because they might break it. You would never, you would never see a, a non-ambulatory child and take away the wheelchair. I, I really like that a lot, Ms. Patty. See, this, this is why this format works out so great. We can learn from each other across the state. We do encourage you to follow us on uh, social media, on our Facebook and on our Twitter, and visit us on our website uh, so that you can get more and more tools for uh, implementing AAC. And again, this is how you can access the presentation, but also the link is uh, within the chat.
Um, thank you all so much for joining today. I'm gonna jump into the Q&A right now with Teresa and uh, see if y'all have any questions or comments. How do you address families who aren't understanding or interested? Okay, so I think that, I think that uh, families understand or, or get sold when they get to see, um, when they get to see that it works. Right. So if you found there's a, a really cool lady that um, she does AAC with her family and she uh, shows all the other children implementing AAC with their family. And they um, and, and basically you, when you see it work for somebody, it kind of gets you sold on um, on it working for your for yourself. You know, so when you talk to families that um, say oh, well, they'll never be interested in this. So they'll never be interested in that. Finding success stories, I find, is one of the best tools for that. Um, I'm going to go up. Since AAC can range, can include a range of methods and strategies as well as higher low tech, it doesn't always require a device. Students should have strategies for communication and family will be, be able and willing to use. It's very true. The, um, there are some friends that... Uh, that even just having a core language board up just to have that visual of, uh, of language um, really, really helps them be able to organize language, but it didn't mean that they needed a full blown device, but uh, using those strategies that we're all familiar with um, for AAC implementation really, really does help for sure. 